Notice how the psalmist also in the very end speaks about how his enemies have hardened their hearts against God, refusing to even acknowledge him as a servant of the Lord. When he says, no passerby will shout, may you be blessed. They don't want their enemy, this man of God, to be blessed. They will not say, we, ble we in the Lord's name bless you. And so there is a, just a, a complete hatred and animosity against uh, the servant of the Lord. And, and we'll see the same thing in the life of our Lord Jesus in the text in which we are going to deal with this morning from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35, on page 847 of your pew Bible, where Jesus is also being opposed. He's being warned about uh, Herod who wants to kill him. Let's read together those words sent from Luke chapter 13, verse 31 to the end of the chapter. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case... I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Brothers, sisters of our Lord in Jesus Christ, the children, perhaps you have heard a story about the fox and the hen. Many different variations on that particular story, but they basically all have the same theme. Right? The fox? Well, the fox is that sly animal. Wants to kill and wants to eat the hen. The fox uses his cunning ways to try to trick the hen uh, so that the hen, so that he can catch the hen and kill her. But you know in the story that the hen knows what the fox is up to. And he's not fooled by the fox. In the end, the hen always outsmarts the fox. Now this is a story we call it a fable. A fable is a story that teaches some real life lessons. Now, I don't know what the origins of the fable is, but it's very likely uh, that it is inspired indeed by the story about the Lord Jesus here in our text and so much in our, our literature, especially literature going back hundreds of years, uh, has been inspired by, by Scripture. Luke tells us a story about the Lord Jesus being warned by the Pharisees that Herod, who is the king, wants to kill him. What does Jesus do? Jesus calls Herod a fox. Because Herod is devious. In his devious ways, he is trying to kill him. But Jesus, this text also compares himself to a hen who wants to protect her chicks from danger by gathering her chicks under her wings. Well, this story re reflects the reality of the, the spiritual battle that has taken place in the world in which we're living it's a battle that God already talked about in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 when God said there would be a battle between the seed of the serpent who, are, uh, who followed the devil and the seed of the woman who are God's people. And ultimately the seed of the woman, the child of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there will be this constant battle, spiritual battle taking place in this world. Well, the Lord Jesus, at the time of our text, is traveling uh, to Jerusalem. But this visit to Jerusalem isn't going to be a nice visit because the enemy's watching. And also this sly fox, Ver uh, Herod, is looking for an opportunity to kill and to destroy the Lord Jesus. 
But the Lord Jesus is not, uh, not afraid of this fox. He knows what this fox is up to. In fact, the Lord Jesus expects that he's going to die, but he will die there in the city of Jerusalem because that is his mission. He will walk into the very city that, that should, where the people should embrace him as their Savior, but instead, no, they're going to oppose him, and they will ultimately they will crucify him on the cross. So you might ask yourself, so did this sly fox, and did those enemies of the Lord Jesus, did they really outsmart Jesus Christ? And the answer is not at all. Because the Lord Jesus came in order that he might die on the cross, that he might pay the penalty for the sins of his people. And so the foxes in this world, they may think that they are more cunning than Jesus Christ. But it is the foxes. It is the enemies of Christ who will be destroyed eternally. And it is Jesus Christ and all those who find security under the protection of his wings who will enjoy the glorious life in the kingdom of God forevermore. And so this morning, I proclaim to you God's word under this theme. In his compassion, Jesus is determined to fulfill his mission to redeem his people. The word redeem means to, to pay for the sins of his people, to save his people. So our theme then is compassion. Jesus is determined to fulfill his mission to redeem his people. We're going to look at three things. First of all, we'll look at the hen or the fox in the hen house. And secondly, we'll look at the hen who gathers her chicks. And thirdly, we'll, seek, uh, the one, we'll look at the one who comes in the name of the Lord. During his entire ministry, already from the time of his birth, the Lord Jesus was constantly faced with opposition, those who hated him. And so there were also in Israel, there were many of his own people who hated his message. At times they were even offended by the mighty works and miracles that he did. Now the modern world, or the modern word today, is that Jesus often, is that Jesus often said and did things that triggered, those that were triggered, the people. And so our society now talks about things that trigger people, that make people upset. And so it means that Jesus often did things that highly offended the people, that caused them, that triggered them to become angry, to become outraged, to become outsensed against him. Well, earlier in this chapter, remember the Lord Jesus healed this crippled woman, crippled for some 18 years. He did that on the Sabbath day. And when you read the story, you think, oh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful story um, that Jesus did for this, one, for this woman who had suffered so much in her lifetime. But what we're told is that the synagogue ruler was incensed. He was triggered, you could say, because he did it. Why? Because Jesus did it on the Sabbath day. And so what you see is the Lord Jesus constantly faced opposition as people opposed him and rejected his work. And that's why the Lord Jesus then also warned in the previous story, and we dealt with that just before I went on holidays, that the door into the kingdom of God is a narrow door. So Jesus says, so that even though there are many in this world who will try to enter into the kingdom of heaven, and they will try hard in their own way, but they will not be able to. And so when Jesus says, uh, the, when Jesus talks about the narrow door, he means that there is only one way into the kingdom of heaven, and that one way is through the Lord Jesus and him alone. But Jesus says, but you know, there are many people who will try to enter into the kingdom in their own way. But Jesus says, but no matter how hard they may try, they're, they're not going to be able to enter because I, your Savior, I am the only way there to the Father in heaven. There is no other way. And now here in this story, we're told that the people rejected the Lord Jesus and that the Lord Jesus is being opposed by his enemies. Jesus is not only... Jesus is not embraced by the people as the only Savior that was sent by God from heaven. No, rather than embracing the one God sends, oh, they oppose him, they reject him. And Jesus says, beware. 
There's no salvation outside of me, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Now Luke now goes on and tells us that at this particular time there were some Pharisees. Pharisees are leaders, spiritual leaders in Israel, who came to the Lord Jesus and told him that Herod wants to kill you. Well, perhaps we're all familiar with the name Herod. Herod, remember, was the king uh, in Israel when the Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That Herod, he, he commanded all the babies in Jerusalem to be killed, hoping that he would also kill the little baby Jesus. We know that Herod died, and Jesus, I mean, Joseph and Mary were able to take Jesus back from Egypt and come back uh, to Israel. And so the Herod that we're talking about here in our text is not that Herod long ago, but this is his son. And when Herod died, the first Herod died, and his kingdom was divided among his children. And so this Herod we're talking about here ruled over the northern part of Israel to which Galilee belonged. And Galilee is the area in the north where the Lord Jesus spent most of his ministry. That's where he spent most of his time when he was preaching and teaching and doing his miracles. Whereas Jerusalem, which is now in, in, in the south, and the Judea, in Judea, the area around Jerusalem, that was governed by Pontius Pilate. And so the Pharisees now tell Jesus that Herod, he wants to, to kill you. Well, remember who this Herod, what this Herod has done. This Herod is the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist is the one who came and introduced the Lord Jesus to the people of Israel. Matthew tells us in ch chapter 14, 1 and 2, uh, that this Herod heard reports about Jesus. And it made him scared. It frightened him because he thought, perhaps this is John the Baptist who's come back to life again. Now, the Pharisees do not tell Jesus why Herod wants uh, to, to kill him. But it's safe to say uh, that Herod is afraid of the growing influence that the Lord Jesus is having over the people in his territory. Now, on the other hand, we also do not know why the Pharisees who hated the Lord Jesus, why they warned him about this. We know there are some Pharisees who took the side of the Lord Jesus and, uh, and who were not hostile to him, but yet most of the Pharisees hated the Lord Jesus and wanted to kill him. Perhaps when, when Jesus later on in our text says uh, that the prophet cannot, no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem, perhaps he understands that the Pharisees uh, are trying to get him to, to leave Galilee, to leave the area of Herod, that he might go to Jerusalem so that there in Jerusalem the Pharisees might be able to, to kill him. That's a possibility. Makes good sense, but we really don't know if that is truly their whole or even their motivation. More important for us, as the reader is to pay attention to the reaction that the Lord Jesus has to this warning. He doesn't say thank you to these leaders uh, and, and be grateful that they have given him a, a warning. No, what does he do? He says, go tell that fox. And he says, go tell Herod, that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and on the third day I will reach my goal. Now, when Jesus calls Herod a fox, the first thing it tells us is that Jesus recognizes, recognizes Herod to be a great enemy. You know, a fox cannot be trusted. A fox is different than, let's say, an, a lion. Children, you know, a lion is frightening, right? And, and a lion doesn't use cunning or slyness to try to catch his prey. No, he uses his overwhelming power to attack. But not a fox. A fox is sly and he's cunning and he's kind of there in the background, finding a, a way in which he might be able to pounce and, and get what he wants. And so Herod then too does not come across as a fierce enemy. He often comes across as one who, who cares about the people of Israel and cares about the people. But he works more behind the scenes looking for opportunities to attack. Remember, too, that Herod is an Edomite. And if you know some of the history of the people of Israel, you know that an Edomite is a descendant of Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. They were the twins born of Isaac. 
Jacob is, you say, the father of Israel. Esau was the father of the Edomites. And for centuries, the descendants of Israel and the descendants of Esau were arch enemies. Well, like I said, Herod here is like the fox in the, in, in the hen house. The people of Israel, you say, are, they are God's people. They live in the hen house. And Herod is like the fox, that Edomite, that descendant of Esau, who, who has power, has control over the people of Israel, and, and work behind the scenes trying to, to use that for his own agenda. And so Jesus calls out Herod as the great threat that he really is you know, to the people of Israel. And when we reflect on this, you can think also about the tactic that the devil has used within the church for ages. Devil knows if he can get a fox into the church, that fox can do great damage. You know, foxes in the church may not appear to be threatening, but in their sly and their cunning way, they're there to undermine the people of God undermine their faith and undermine their, their relationship with God. And how do they do that? Well, they do that by, by twisting the Word of God. They do that by manipulating the gospel message in a way that they undermine the truth about God's Word of salvation in Jesus Christ. And in our modern times, church leaders can often also act as, fo as foxes they act as foxes when they promote ungodly, the ungodly values of our society as if now they are good and now they are moral even though the Lord in His Word has spoken about them as being evil and sinful. Right? Foxes in the church are our leaders who, who undermine the gospel when they, when they teach, for example. They'll say, you know what? The Lord Jesus, He didn't really come to, to pay for our sins. What a ridiculous idea. They say, no, no, Jesus was just a good man. Somebody that we should imitate in our lives, uh, too. But you know that when they say that, what they're really doing is they're undermining the gospel message. When they're telling the people that they can get into heaven without the Lord Jesus. And if you're just a good person, if you just imitate the Lord Jesus, then you will be saved. But that's not the gospel message, beloved. What they do, they undermine the need, our need for the Lord Jesus to be our Savior, for the Lord Jesus to come and to pay for all of my sins. And so we can talk about the foxes in the church, whether it be leaders or people within the church who, who, who don't promote the truth of the gospel. But beloved, we also need to talk about the foxes in our own hearts, and the foxes in our own lives. You experience those foxes when you're in your own heart. Your own heart is set on earthly and set on sinful desires. Quite often, don't we do things that we know are, are not right, that are against the will of God? And what do we do? We justify our sinful actions as if, you know, well, somehow we're okay. What we did was, okay, was, was all right. Or if God's demands are just maybe just too, too, too heavy and, and therefore I can do whatever I want. Even though the Lord says differently. Right? Sometimes we, we also try to minimize what we have done. You know, it wasn't all that bad. And, and so we kind of just kind of brush it off and, and don't deal with our sins seriously as, as we should. Often aren't we guilty of that? Right? I, I yell at my wife because of my, I got angry. Oh, well, it was her fault. Well, it's not her fault. It's, I'm responsible for the fact that I yelled at her in a way that was not right and that was sinful. Or we might convince ourselves, even the Lord says differently, that what I feel to be right in my heart, that must be right, that must be good, right? That's what we're told today by people in our society. Why? Because we live in a society in which people no longer recognize sin. And people will say today, you know, as long as you don't hurt others, and if it feels right, and it feels good to you, then it's okay, it's good. Go ahead, do it. And the reality is that, that people don't even realize how many of their actions hurt others, even if they think they don't hurt, yet they hurt others. 
And above all, what did they do? They hurt the Lord God in heaven. Beloved, you need to be aware. We all need to be aware of those foxes that live in our own hearts, in our minds, that lead us away from the Lord our God. Now Jesus says, you tell that fox that I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and the third day I will reach my goal. See, Jesus says, he says, tell Herod that I'm not afraid of him. Herod doesn't intimidate me. His threats are not going to stop me, for I will keep on doing the work I am doing. You see, Jesus makes clear that the gospel work is going to continue and that his enemies have no power to be able to stop him. Oh, the devil and the demons will continue to push back against the Lord Jesus, but Jesus says, I will continue to drive out the demons. The devil may continue to cause sickness in Israel, but Jesus says, I will continue to heal the people. You see, sickness, you can say, represents the effects of sin in the world in which we are living. But Jesus, what does he do? He continues to display his power to be able to overcome the effects of sin by healing those who are sick. And so here we also have the comfort. Comfort also for us today, beloved. While the enemies of Christ and the enemies of his church, of his people, continue to oppose, continue to attack God's people, even today, they do that even today. Yet Jesus will continue to carry out his work from the right hand of God there in heaven, where the resurrected Lord is ruling over all things. From there, beloved, he will protect his people. There he will continue to make the gospel message of salvation to be a powerful force in the world in which we live. Right, he, our Lord, overcomes the sinful. He overcomes the stubborn hearts of mankind. How does he do that? He does that through his word, and he does that through the power of his Holy Spirit. Right, by, the, by his power, Christ comes with his spirit. He renews the hearts of his people, and he grants us the joy of being forgiven and the joy of receiving eternal life. Now, Jesus says that he will do this today, tomorrow, and the third day. He will reach his goal. Now, we need to understand Jesus is not literally speaking here about three days. But he uses an expression to show that for a short but a limited time, he's going to continue on doing this work. And he says to Herod, this fox, he says, you will not be able to stop me. And then on the third day, he says, I will reach the goal for my life. Now, the question here is, what is that goal? Well, that becomes clear in verse 33. Uh, where Jesus says this, he says, in any case, I must press on uh, today and tomorrow and the next day. And we use the same language as he just used in the previous verse, verse 32, about that time frame, a limited time frame, but short one. And indicates then that the goal is this, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. You see, Herod, the sly fox, he has plans to kill the Lord Jesus there in Galilee. But Jesus says, Herod, tell that fox that he will not be successful, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Notice Jesus says, he says, I must, I must press on. We often speak about this as the divine must. In other words, Jesus must go to Jerusalem. Why? Because that is God's plan. Tell that fox that God has given me this mission to go to Jerusalem and that he has no power to prevent me from going because that is the will of God. Okay, so you must go to Jerusalem, but why? Well, remember Jerusalem, you can say Zion. Zion is the city of God. This is where the temple of God is found. And so when the people of Israel uh, were to bring their sacrifices to pay for their sins to God, what did they do? They would go to Jerusalem and bring their sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem, which was the house of God. And so Christ says he's going to go to Jerusalem. Why? That he might offer his own life to God as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. 
And for that reason, he cannot die outside of Jerusalem. For this is the place where the sacrifice must be given, where he will pay for the sins of his people. It tells us that the Lord Jesus is very conscious of the role that his father has given him to do. The sly fox cannot stop him from giving his life for the sins of Israel there in Jerusalem. And not only is the Lord Jesus not afraid of his powerful enemies, but he is also determined that he will carry out the mission that his father had given him to do. So here again, beloved, what you see here, you see that great spiritual battle taking place between the powers of the kingdom of darkness and the power of the Son of God, who is Jesus. All the peoples of the earth, they might oppose the Lord Jesus, but the Lord Jesus is not deterred from his mission. No, he must go on. He must win the battle there in Jerusalem. He must offer up his life on the cross. He must pay for the sins of his people. Jesus fulfills his mission because of the compassion, because of the love that he has for his people. You hear that compassion and that love in verse 34 and when he cries out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent, who those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chick under her wings and you were not willing. You were not willing. You see, beloved, Jerusalem is a city on which the Lord has poured out his love, poured out his mercy. Throughout many thousands of years of their history, God repeatedly sent his prophets to call his people back. And every time they, every time they did stray, the prophets would call them back to the Lord. But what did the people of, Israel, of Jerusalem do? Well, what they often did is they killed the prophets and they stoned them to death. Why? Because they refused to listen. They refused to repent, and instead they hardened their hearts against the Lord their God. But you notice here, beloved, in our text, that, that the Lord God doesn't come to us as his people as a heartless God. We don't have a hard and a mean God. We don't have a God who makes unreasonable demands upon us as his people. In fact, he does just the opposite. He's a God who sends his prophets. Why? That they might speak to them about God's grace. That they might remind them about God's promise that he will redeem and that he will save them from their sins. He sends his prophets to, to call the people to live by faith and to call them to trust the Lord for everything they need in their life. And so to, to also speak of that compassion, Jesus uses the figure of a mother hen. You see, when, when a hen sees danger, when she sees the fox in the hen house, she calls to her chicks to come and to hide under her wings. And so when, when the hen sees danger, she makes these loud clucking noises and calls the chicks to, to come to her. And the chicks, they come scurrying from everywhere and to seek shelter under their mother's wings. The hen, the hen provides security and safety for them. Jesus says literally, he says, how often I will to gather your children together, but you are not willing. It was my will to gather you, my people, but you, you did not will it. You see the little chicks? Perhaps children, have you seen um, a hen with little chicks ever? And you'll see little chicks that will come running to their mother when the mother calls them. It's a neat little neat sight when you see them. They all kind of hide and they kind of disappear under their mother's wings. And so Jesus says, I was like that. I, I, I called you, my little chicks, to come to me. But you, my people, you, you refuse to gather under my wings when I call to protect you. The Lord Jesus was willing to give up everything, even willing to give his very own life to save us. But he says, you, my people, you refuse to come to me for your life and your salvation. How foolish. That's an attitude that was present through much of the history of Israel. It was 
Christ-like attitude that was present also here during the time of the Lord Jesus. And that should also warn us, beloved, of the danger for us. The danger that we do not listen to the call of our Lord. And you may ask, so, so why is it that, that people, even those who claim that they, they want to be God's people and want to serve the Lord Jesus, why is it that so often they resist and they fight against the call of Jesus Christ? And the reason is simply this. It's because of the sinful attitude that lives in all of our hearts. Because of that sinful attitude, I don't want to, uh, to be dependent on anybody else. I want to be self-sufficient. I want to believe that, that I'm able to take care of my own life. And that I don't depend on anybody else. And therefore, because of that hardness in our hearts we want to live, we act as our hearts desire. The natural, sinful inclination of our hearts... Beloved, is this, is that I want to take care of my own life. I want to be in control of my own life. I want to decide the things in my own life. It seems natural to think also that if I just live a, a decent human life, that I don't need the Lord Jesus to come and to pay for my sins. I can take care of myself. But beloved, when the Holy Spirit comes, He works in your heart. And he brings humility within you. What does he do? He creates within us an awareness. An awareness that, that we cannot do anything ourselves, but that we depend upon the Lord for everything. When you realize that the Lord Jesus is your complete Savior, what does it do? It brings a sense, a real sense of relief in your life. Right, we know when we look around, there's danger all around me. Danger all the time. There, there are those who, who want to lead me away from the Lord Jesus. There's danger also here in my heart that the sinful desires within me, they work against me, in which I don't which want to do my own things. But beloved, when you hear the call of the Lord Jesus, and listen to that call, you come and, and you are gathered under his protective wings. It's like an impossible bird and is lifted up from your shoulders. You're safe. Safe under the wings of your Savior. When you're safe, then you can put away the anxieties. And you put away the worries and the cares of this life. Because now you fully know and you fully trust that your life is safe in the hands of your Lord. That he is like the mother hen. He's the one that I can flee to. He's the one that I look for eternal protection. I know they're under the shelter of his wings. I am safe. Now and for eternity. If the Lord Jesus has given his life on the cross to pay for all of my sins, if I know that he has indeed bought me with his blood so that I now belong to my Savior, if he is the one who has now brought me into the family of God, then our greatest joy is to praise him as our God and to honor Christ as my Savior. What a glorious hope. You can also look to the future, beloved, with joy, with confidence. Verse 35, the Lord leaves his people with both a warning but also with a wonderful hope for the future. Jesus there speaks to the Pharisees and the people of Israel. He says, look, look, your, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus is saying, you know, only in a short little while you will be rejected by God and you will be put... I guess the point I'm making here is in a little while, Jesus is saying to the people, he says, you will reject me. You will put me to, you will put me to death on the cross even though I came in order to deliver you from your sins. And so, because his people are going to, to reject him and crucify him, the Lord God is going to bring his judgment, and he's going to bring his punishment upon them. He speaks about your house. Your house will be desolate. In other words, your fate has been sealed. 
Your house here is, is a reference, could be a reference to the temple, likely also a, a reference uh, to the city of Jerusalem. And so the house of Israel is left desolate. The horrible fate of Jerusalem is sealed because of their disobedience, their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The city will be destroyed. And we know uh, that in 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem will be completely destroyed by the Romans even as the Lord Jesus Christ had foretold it. And the rejection of the Savior will lead to their own destruction. I tell you, Jesus says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These are words that come from Psalm 118, verse 26. These are words that will be shouted a matter of maybe just a few weeks after this event. Uh, when Jesus makes a triumphal entry into in Jerusalem. But this is not what the Lord Jesus is referring to. Jesus is referring to the time of the parousia. He's referring to the time of his final return from heaven on the last day, the day of judgment. When Jesus returns from heaven, on the day of judgment, then they will see the one whom they have crucified coming back to this earth. On that day they will tremble as they say, have to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, in Psalm 118, these words were spoken about the Messiah, about the Savior God was going to send to his people Israel. Psalm 118, verse 22, the Savior God sends to Israel, the psalmist says, will be like a stone that is rejected by the builders. Right? A stone that is used to, to build a building but that becomes the cornerstone because God will choose it as the cornerstone. The Messiah, the Savior, is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He will be rejected by mankind, but he's sent by God to be the cornerstone of God's church, to be our cornerstone. That doesn't mean, beloved, that everyone in Israel was going to be destroyed. You know that there are also many in Israel who will repent from their sins and who will look in faith to the Lord Jesus for their salvation. And so the warning for, for you and for me today is that everyone who rejects the Lord Jesus as the cornerstone sent by God to save us from our sins, they will be destroyed just as God laid Jerusalem desolate and destroyed the whole city. But beloved, it is through faith in Jesus Christ that today you too can look to the future with confidence, with joy. That Jesus made clear earlier in this chapter. He says, you know, there is no other way into the kingdom of heaven but through the saving work of, of Jesus Christ, my saving work. And therefore, when Christ returns, beloved, it will be a day of great rejoicing for all those who humbly are gathered under the wings of Christ Jesus. And when he comes, can you imagine that day? When he comes... We will welcome him with loud shouts of joy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.